see, some things have high luster, like diamond has, come on, man, that's a bad look. I didn't do it, it just, it just fell off. What's the one thing I want them to remember about me? Charm, I guess. I don't know, <laughs> actually, I've never thought about that. I hope it's not a negative thing that they remember. They're like, boy, that guy would not shut up. <laughs> Dude, you already know what I am, but there's one recognizable thing about me that I share with many other and not so recognizable minerals. Um, if this isn't pyrite or Calga <laughs> <Yeah>, pyrite. <laughs> the most striking thing about it, other than its sheer heft, is its luster. It's highly metallic. I think you can see it if you look closely and even not so closely. You can see on all of these faces as I rotate it, it shines like Metal, I mean, so luster is a word used to describe the brightness and kind of quality of the light that reflects off the surface of a gem or a mineral. And metallic luster is used to describe light that reflects off of minerals like it does off of metals. And you can see that this looks like a big hunk of metal because of how shiny it is, lustrous it is. This gigantic hunk of pyrite. Maybe 500 years ago, someone might have seen this and thought they'd found their fortune. Don't be fooled by pyrite. It may look very gold and metallically lustrous, but it's not as yellow as gold. It's a little bit more brassy than gold is. A nugget of this <laughs> magnitude of gold simply never occurs like this. Gold is very soft and you often find it in flakes and little tiny nuggets sitting at the bottoms of streams because of how dense it is. They both form in the cubic crystal system, but you can see pyrite has lots of flat faces to it. I don't see a whole lot of outright cubes in this particular specimen. They've all got these striations on them that are really cool, all of these flat faces do. You've got striations oriented in this direction, and then on the other face, they're oriented in this direction. So they're at 90 degrees to each other from one face to another. There are many examples all over this specimen of intergrowth. This big guy and this big guy, these two guys over here, these guys over here, it just, it's occurring all over the specimen. And I love that twinning phenomena. It's just very cool. It, it looks like something went wrong, but nothing went wrong. It's just nature doing its thing. Unlike the last one, I have no clue for this one, so I'm going in blind. Oh, okay. This guy is chalcopyrite. It borrows from Greek, chalcos, meaning copper, because it is an ore of copper. You can see, like pyrite, it has a highly metallic luster to it. It just swing. It's also sometimes called Apache gold. There are some specimens that we've seen just already that are more like gold than fool's gold. I can understand why this was at one point called Apache gold. It was also called copper gold sometimes. So this chalcopyrite is a sulfide and a sulfide is just one or more metals combined with sulfur. How would you know that this is chalcopyrite, not pyrite and not gold? Well, chalcopyrite is softer than pyrite. Chalcopyrite can be scratched with a nail, not fingernail, like an iron nail, and pyrite will not be easily scratched with a nail. They both have a similar streak. A mineral or a gem's streak is when you scrape it, streak it against a rough piece of ceramic and then you look at the color of the powder that it leaves behind. Chalcopyrite and pyrite streak very similarly, a greenish to black streak. And then gold, if you were to perform a streak test, would be much more yellow. The streak test is one of the last resorts in a gemologist testing arsenal because it is a destructive test. Whatever you streak is removed from the specimen. It's not coming back. It's gonna stay on that <laughs> ceramic plate. Gold in color is also much more yellow. It's also denser. Pyrite also is denser than chalcopyrite and it is harder as well. So those are just a couple of ways that you can tell them apart. This is how you might actually find it forming in nature, just coming up out of the ground. So this one's forming on some really cool flaky siderite perched right on top, nice, super metallic, flat faces on these crystals. One last difference between pyrite and chalcopyrite is that chalcopyrite is in the tetragonal crystal system, whereas pyrite is part of the cubic crystal system. You won't really see pyrite forming in this kind of a shape. This one also, if you'll remember from the gigantic pyrite specimen, how could you forget it? This one lacks the um, parallel striations that that big specimen has. Another little tell if you're looking at big old nuggets out in nature. This little fossil is one of my favorites in our collection. I did say it was a fossil. That is because it is a fossilized ancient 
million year old sea creature. Fossils are formed when a material like agate or chalcedony replaces the organic material in a dead thing over millions and millions of years. Sometimes that organic material can be replaced by something a little bit more interesting. Sometimes you can get opal in there, and in this case, we have pyrite. So these guys were in the seas around, I think, up to 65 million years ago, but they went extinct along with the dinosaurs. But it does have some descendants bebopping around in the ocean, octopi, squid, nautilus. There's a reason that you don't see tons and tons of pyritized fossils, fossils succumbing to the pyrite disease, as some people call it. I call it a pyrite blessing, maybe, I don't know. Anyways, uncommon geologic conditions. One, it has to kind of occur in fairly anaerobic water, which is water where not a lot of oxygen has been dissolved. These also have to be buried pretty rapidly and pretty deep by ocean sediment where there's not a whole lot of oxygen or other organic material present, which is a pretty difficult spot to find at the bottom of an ancient, ancient ocean where things have been dying and settling for a very long time. It's hard to find a parking space on the ocean floor, you know? This box is heavier than most unboxing boxes. Given the metallic luster theme, kind of gives me a hint. Wait till you see this. That is our heavy specimen. See, some things have high luster, like diamond has, come on, man, that's a bad look. <laughs> I didn't do it, 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 just, it just fell off. I mean, so this has a hardness of one, but I didn't scratch it, it just fell off. Moving on. So some things like diamond have a very, very high adamantine luster. And this is highly lustrous as well. It's just a totally different kind. It's metallic, it looks like metal. Molybdenite and chalcopyrite in there in between. So we've got a very silvery body color, very silvery fingers, and the chalcopyrite, which is the brassier component kind of in between. Two slightly different lusters, really cool though. I would say the molybdenite is even more lustrous than the chalcopyrite. So molybdenite from Australia, molybdenite from Japan. This honestly feels like just a slightly differently colored piece of aluminum foil. You see these fold lines? It'll bend incredibly easily. This is a hardness of one to a one and a half on the Mohs scale. Jeez, they're just so thin and tiny and delicate. So despite its real softness, a Mohs level of one, which is softer than your fingernail, it is commonly used in alloys to strengthen other alloyed metals and give anti-corrosion properties to metals used in things like boilers, gun barrels, rocket thrusters, things that really have to take a beating and stay intact. And this soft, thin little dude is a key ingredient in making that happen. This has been used in industrial processes for a long time because it was discovered in the late 18th century. Which is a good thing because we've been using gun barrels for a long time as well. Molybdenite also has a bright future in semiconductors. There's currently research done on the possible replacement of molybdenite in silicon semiconductors. You got a bright future, kid, I'm pulling for you. But moving on, they do have a bright future, but I wanna talk about this guy right here. This is carborundum, and carborundum is just an industry name for what it actually is, silicon carbide. It's very delicate, I can feel it's turning my hands silver and shiny. Very crumbly, and if I were to drop it, it would bust apart but it's very hard. It has a similar crystal structure to diamond, and it's also got a Mohs hardness of nine, which is high, higher than most. This specimen was made in a smokestack where synthetic moissanite is manufactured, which is really, really cool. Like diamond in an industrial setting, this is also used for abrasives, grinding things, and polishing things because it's harder than most other materials. It is very resistant to thermal expansion, so when it heats up, it doesn't expand or warp very much at all. It's also resistant to corrosion. It just adds to its possibilities of industrial application. Well, this one's dense too. Something about metallic minerals, they get heavy. Let's unbox this guy. I've got no clue. I've got no clue. I know what one of them is. Never mind, I, I, second, I had to take a second look. I don't wanna say I've been waiting for this one or expecting it, but I've kind of been expecting it. So the, it's, it's not super duper brightly lustrous, but it is metallically lustrous, and that is why it is part of this episode as well. It's a little toxic, but I'm not worried about it. So this dense, thick, heavy boy is Galena on 
dolomite. It is also a sulfide, which like I mentioned earlier, is one or more metals combined with sulfur. Like I've already said, it's very dense, heavy for its size, and it's got really cool surface features. Galena is the most important and prominent ore of lead in the world, which is important for manufacturing. It can also contain silver, which is known as argentiferous galena, which makes the ore that contains it even more valuable. It's part of the cubic crystal system. If you thought that just from looking at these sharp edges, you'd be correct. This is indeed part of the cubic crystal system. Not everything that looks cubic is necessarily part of the cubic crystal system, but this is one time where you can trust that. Galena is an ore of lead, which means that it plays a key role in the battery that starts your car, and it's also used in energy storage in hybrid vehicles as well. It's also a popular collector's specimen, particularly aesthetic pieces like this one perched delicately and daintily atop a pile of dolomite. If you do have Galena in your collection, just do like what I'm gonna do in a couple minutes and wash your hands after you handle it because it's a little toxic. I mean, it's lead, guys. It's an ore of lead. There's lead in here. At first glance, I wasn't really sure why this guy was in this episode, the metallic luster episode, Cinnabar. But as I was rotating it, like any good gemologist, you gotta look from all angles. Some of these faces do have metallic luster. Like this guy, Super high luster, not very metallic, and quite, get out of here, lead. These guys over here, highly lustrous, and a bit of metallic in the quality of the luster. This is a rough specimen. This is how it came out of the ground. And it's also got really cool triangular markings on the surface that all point up in one direction. And then other faces have parallel striations on them. So not only do they have different surface markings, but some of them have different lusters, and that's very cool, on one specimen. Cinnabar is strikingly red, which is why its name, Cinnabar, is derived from Arabic and Persian words meaning dragon's blood. It was popular around the world to crush it up and use it in pigments, and in China, it was used for that purpose prehistorically. Unfortunately, it's toxic, and some people would grind it up and ingest it in an effort to prolong their lives. So this was used in ancient China, very popular to coat the floors and the walls with this deep, what's now known as Chinese red. It's been banned from use in pigments pretty much throughout the entire world. So you're not gonna see too much Chinese red in wallpaper anymore. Three, two, one. Whoa, look at that. Oh gosh, I wasn't expecting this today. It just looks so otherworldly, man. Doesn't look like it's supposed to happen but it do. So you can clearly see why this is graded as a metallically lustrous. Yet another sulfide, one or more metals combined with sulfur. This is marcasite. In kind of the old world, it was used as a key source of sulfur, but now it doesn't have so many very practical industrial applications anymore. It was also used in jewelry for a little while, I think during the 1800s. Marcasite can form in a lot of shapes, pyramids, tablets. I would call this one globular. Look at these globules. Great glassy globules. So unlike pyrite, which forms in the cubic crystal system, despite having very similar chemical makeup, this is part of the orthorhombic crystal system, which is why it is allowed to grow all funky like this. This may not look anything like pyrite, but they share the same chemical composition. But pyrite forms in the cubic crystal system, whereas this forms in the orthorhombic crystal system. So pyrite is usually very orderly, and this is all globular and bubbly and wacky looking. And that is an example of a polymorph. So a polymorph is when two different crystals have the same chemical makeup, but occur in different crystal systems. Consider graphite and diamond. They're both straight carbon, but they couldn't be more different, and that's because of their crystal structure. So this has a lot more color variants than pyrite does. So I've got a lot of kind of steely blue metallic washes through here, but there's also lines of kind of a reddish golden color, and even over here, a nice little spot of red. But definitely an abundance of color on this versus pyrite, you're pretty much just gonna get that brassy, kind of dull yellow color. So for today's closer look, I wanna take a look closer <laughs> at Cinnabar. Really great, I think, episode for today. We got to highlight some 
lesser known gemstones just purely based on their luster, metallic luster, which is kind of an uncommon luster in the mineral world. It's really reserved for only a select few minerals that really shine like they're made of metal. Let me know down in the comments what other maybe category or gemstone or variety you'd like to see us unbox next. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that bell. And of course, thanks for watching.